Hey everybody, thanks for joining us today. Waters Church exists to see people's lives changed in the name of Jesus. And if you'd like to be a part of that life change that happens here every week, both in person and online, you can partner with us financially. Just go to waterschurch.org slash give and select the giving option that works best for you. Thanks again for joining us and we hope that you enjoy today's message. So much of our culture is consumed with individual identity and self-actualization. We want so much to make something of ourselves, but is it making us happy? Is personal identity really the goal of God for humanity? There is a better way. In the garden, Jesus prayed for you to become what you were made to be. Forget personal goals and selfish ambitions. There is something far better. A world trapped in increasing loneliness needs to see the ultimate result of the gospel, one church. A united, loving, and strong family of faith where every person matters and everyone counts. In the church, we find who we are. And the best part is, Jesus is already making it happen. It's time for the church to glow up. Well, happy Easter, Waters Church! Good to see all of you. My name is Tim, I'm a pastor here with my wife Cheryl, and if you are here for the first time, it's our prayer that it is not the last time, but that you feel the love of God in this place, and that you come on back and be part of this church. Can I get a good amen from all the regulars? Come on. Yeah. Amen. You got your glow sticks? Everybody got your glow sticks? Wave them up in the air for me. Woo-hoo. I've been amazed all week long, all weekend long at how much the older people among us are excited about the glow sticks. Because that was our big worry. Like all the old people are going to be like, this is not church. This is a concert. And all the old people are here like, yeah, baby. <laughs> love it. Love it. We're starting a new series of messages called Glow Up, Thus the Glow Sticks. And unless you're under the age of 14, there's a good chance you have no idea what glow up means. So I'm going to explain it to you. I actually had to be explained this myself uh, because I was uh, talking about a series that we were going to do on Easter and going after Easter about identity, and, and one of our staff members, one of our children's workers, had to come from the children's workers, of course. They're very in touch with the young people of our day, and, and they said, well, why don't we call it Glow Up? And I'm like, what the heck does that mean? I don't even know what that means. And I am as hip as it gets. I didn't know what it means. <laughs> And uh, she said, well, this is what it means. It means that you're, you know, you're glowing up from being a kid, growing into an adult. And so I looked it up on the Urban Dictionary, that very reliable online dictionary available to all of us where anybody can make a definition for any word ever. And here's the Urban Dictionary definition for glow up. It means to experience an incredible transformation post-puberty or teen years. Wow, she really did glow up. And so this is what it means. It means that you become somebody different, somebody new, somebody that you uh, never were before. And I think, um, wow, what a great phrase. I have a daughter presently right now. She's 15. She is in the process of glowing up into just a beautiful young woman. And so yesterday I got my gun license. And I'm so excited about (laughs) who she's becoming. And... uh, you know, how many remember how awkward, though, those years were before puberty and then during puberty, and then you were completely different after that process? And I was thinking, man, I should share that with you people. Like, what did your pastor look like before he became this good looking? I was just thinking about that myself, you know? <laughs> and I was, so I thought I'd share, like, I have glowed up. I have glowed, 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 not glown, glowed. <laughs> I have glowed up. I wanted to show you my before. This is before puberty, when I was 10 years old. There I am. <laughs> Look at that. Not many guys 10 years old can rock that suit. I'm just telling you right now, that was my, my sister's wedding day. I was the ring bearer. And look at how nervous I look. I just, I don't look happy. I don't know why <laughs> I look so miserable, but maybe it's because I had yet to glow up. And so I thought, well, what's the after? Like, that was before, and I wanted to show you my glowed up picture, my glowed up picture. Here's me in the after. Let's get a look at that. Oh, <laughs> there you go, right there. Duck face and everything, everybody. I did the duck face on purpose because I wanted to prove to you ladies how ridiculous the duck face really looks. <laughs> yes, amen. Come on, men. Yes, ridiculous. Some of you ladies are like, oh, it only looks ridiculous on you. No, that's what we think you look like. Mm. 
Dump, dump. <laughs> quack, quack, snap, snap, post, post, like, like. What the heck are we becoming? Duck face. <laughs> I was wondering about this idea of glowing up. Like, this idea that we just want to be somebody. It really is what it comes down to is we want to have some sort of identity that's different than what we are. We long to be different. Every year we make resolutions. We want to be different. We want to become someone. Uh, I was thinking about how it's kind of becoming a cultural obsession with our country to be unique, to be special, to be celebrated. Like, like today, the generation that is coming up has been groomed into this, sort of, so, so to speak, and it's the older generation's fault too, so we've kind of, we've kind of put it on them that, that our younger generation doesn't just want to find their identity. Now they want to demand that we celebrate their identity. And how dare you question what makes me me. And it's becoming actually something that's probably a little bit bad for America. I was reading online on USA Today reports that the number one goal of our teenage generation, right now the teenagers of this generation, number one goal far outpacing the percentage of teens who want to make a lot of money, far outpacing the percentage of teens who want to do something meaningful with their lives or have lots of meaningful relationships or to have a nice family, far outpacing all those desires, the number one goal for the young people, for the teenage, uh, teenagers of this generation is to be famous, to be famous and not for any reason whatsoever. They don't care what they're famous for. They just want to be famous for being famous. It's like a lot of people are trying desperately to actually keep up with the Kardashians. I thought that was a show. I guess it's a mantra for living. And we want to be famous. We want to be well known. We want people to like us. We want people to think well of us, they asked um, 12 to 14 year olds this question. They gave them the choice. They said, given the choice between being Justin Bieber's personal assistant or the president of Harvard, which would you choose? Justin Bieber's personal assistant, president of Harvard, 12 to 14 year olds, three to one margin chose to be Justin Bieber's personal assistant. Now, truth be told, they asked the president of Harvard, and she also wants to be Justin Bieber's personal assistant, so take that for what it's worth. But this desire to be somebody and have everybody celebrate that, and I think it's kind of screwing up America, just my opinion, you don't have to agree with that, we're not in the word yet, but I just kind of think it's kind of screwing up our culture, and, and we're getting something today called identity politics. Have you heard this phrase, identity politics? And identity politics really boils down to one thing, that politicians today have to cater to our identities, not what's good for us. They have to cater to who we think we are, not, not what will enable us to operate and live as we wish in America. And so we've got politicians, I don't know if you're noticing this, but they're kind of getting worse. They're kind of, the options are getting worse because they have to cater to the far, farthest reaches of human identity that are on the fringes of society, the very minute minority groups. And I'm not talking about races. I'm not talking about races. I'm talking about the very fringe minority groups that are boasting and yelling the loudest. And now politicians have to, have to cater to that. And we demand that they celebrate who we are. Are. And I was reading an article in the New York Times by not a conservative thinker. His name is Mark Leela, and he comes from Columbia University. He's a professor of humanities at Columbia University. He writes about the dangers of identity politics. And I want to put his incredible quote up here on the screen. Here's what he says. He says, the fixation of, on diversity in our schools and in the press has produced a generation of liberals and progressives narcissistically unaware of conditions outside their self-defined groups and indifferent to the task of reaching out to Americans in every walk of life. At a very young age, our children are being encouraged to talk about their individual identities even before they have them. Wow. That's so true, right? Like if you're 25, you know that that quote is true. We're encouraging teenagers to discover who they are and they don't even know who they are. And it's like someday they're gonna wake up and they're gonna say, what was I thinking? Come on, you know this intuitively. You think about your teenage self. Come on, what's true about your teenage self? How many know your teenage self was stupid? <laughs> My teenage self was a fool. When I was a teen, 
something happened to our generation. It's kind of a black mark on our generation. It's kind of a, a spoiled mark. There was a rapper that came out by the name of MC Hammer. Some of you know where I'm going with this. And he introduced us into a fashion. His music was fantastic. It was the first CD I ever owned. I loved MC Hammer. I loved him so much, I bought his pants. <laughs> How many remember MC Hammer pants? We have a picture of MC Hammer pants for those of you who forgot. <laughs> Literally, when I was a teenager, I wore those pants every single day. I consciously got up in the morning and put those suckers on. And the funny thing about the MC Hammer pant fad is that when it was a fad, we did not think it was a fad. We thought, we figured out pants now. <laughs> this is what they're supposed to look like. Tight in the waist, tight in the ankles, and so wide in between you could strap toddlers to your thighs and walk through a TSA screening line. We thought that was pants. We did not think, oh, this is just a silly fat. We thought we figured out pants. Could you imagine if we were still wearing MC Hammer pants to this day? And what I'm trying to tell you is that here's what MC Hammer pants were. MC Hammer pants were where I used to be. They were, but before they, were, but before they became a used to be, they were a should be. You should be wearing MC Hammer pants. Why? Because everybody else is. Because it's cool. It's so like morons. We all went to school, you know? MC Hammer. <laughs> it's as good as I can dance, that's it. This is the only dance I know, actually. <laughs> MC Shuffle, whatever it is. Loved it. Couldn't touch this, I'm telling you, couldn't touch this. <laughs> when MC Hammer Pants, man, they are a used to be, and they were at one point a should be. And I thought about this question, and it's in your notes. I want you to fill in the blanks today. I want you to write it down. What should be, quote unquote, should be, what should be am I embracing that will someday be a used to be? What's your MC Hammer pants? So the culture around you is screaming, this is what you're supposed to do. This is what you're supposed to look like. This is what will make you happy. Your identity, and we're getting further and further into, I think, foolishness with this stuff. Because every time we tie our identity to something that culture tells us to be, do you understand? It's like sinking your anchor in moving sand. It's going to shift. Culture changes. And not only does culture change, but there's all kinds of different cultures on the world, right? There's all kinds of different, what we think is right in this country, in Middle Eastern countries, they think it's disgusting. And what they think is right in Middle Eastern countries, we think it's disgusting. Who's right? Who's right? Culture can never be a proper anchor for your identity because culture is always different and culture is always shifting. Here's what God says, tie your identity to me. Get to know who I am. Find who you are in what I am. Because here's the best part about God. God does not change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And when you tie your identity and you find out who you are in God, you are finding yourself in something that is firm, stable, and will not shift out from under you, but will be faithful to you and complete the work he starts in you. Our God is unchanging, and that's good news for a world that is constantly shifting by the trends of society or the people that shout the loudest. Put your identity in God, and nothing will shake you from your firm, eternal foundation. It's the truth of the gospel. It's why Jesus came to reveal to us the Father, to show us what he's like so that we don't just follow whatever trend is. We don't put on the MC Hammer pants and think we've arrived. Well, we start to think differently than the world around us and start to think differently according to the God who formed us. What should be are you embracing that will someday be a... It used to be. You'll wake up in your teen years and say, what was I thinking? And so I found God should be. I did. I found God should be. And it's in John 17. John 17. Jesus prays. We actually, 
We actually should call John 17 the Lord's Prayer. And it's the Lord's Prayer because it's actually the prayer that the Lord prayed. Like we think the Lord's Prayer is, oh yeah, I know that. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. No, no, that's our prayer. He gave us that prayer. But the Lord's Prayer is found in John 17 where we are invited to take a look at the Trinity in action. God the Son calling out to God the Father praying. And what is he praying for? He's praying for you. He's praying for you. And he's calling out to his Father for what we should be. That's beautiful. You want to know what God wants? You should, you should hear the, the prayers of his son. What does God want you to be? Hear the prayers of his son. And I've got news for you. You want to pay attention here. You really, really do. You really, really want to pay attention here. Do you know why? Because I think that there's a good chance you are praying to become something. You're praying to be married. You're praying to be single. You're praying to be a parent. You're praying to be in college. You're praying to be a graduate of college. You're praying to be different. You're praying to be accepted. You're praying to be loved. You're praying to whatever it is. You're praying to be something. Maybe you're praying to be famous. Maybe you're one of those teens. I want to be famous. God, make me famous. I'll, I'll use my fame for you. God, make me rich. I'll use my money for you. Whatever. You're praying to become something, and I got news for you. You want to pay attention to what Jesus prayed for you to be because here's the deal. Here's the deal. It's real simple. On the scoreboard of heaven, when it comes to your prayers and Jesus' prayers, guess whose prayers always wins? Jesus! Like, that's one of the moments where you could have just shouted out Jesus, because, you know, usually in church, the answer to every question is Jesus. Jesus' prayers win. And if you're praying a counter prayer to what Jesus prayed for you to be, God the Father is going to be like, mm, mm-mm. My son already prayed for you about that, and I'm going to listen to him. And so when we go to John chapter 17, we hear what we should. It's the eternal should be. Would you stand with me as we read the first part of Jesus' prayer in this series? Here's what it says in verse 1 of chapter 17 in the book of John. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, The hour has come. Glorify your son that the son may glorify you. This is his prayer. Glorify the son that the son may glorify you. Now, Jesus is talking about his crucifixion, the hour of his crucifixion. This is what he came for. He came to die. He came to bear the sins of the world on that cross 2,000 years ago. That's why Jesus came. And then he says this, since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life. Somebody say eternal life. You've given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all those you have given him. And this is eternal life. Oh, I like this. Pay attention. This is eternal life. That they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. I have manifested your name to the people you have given me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you, for I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them and have come to know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. This is God's word. Let's pray. Father, help us to listen to Jesus, to hear his prayer. Help us in this moment to cut off every other should be. Outside of what Jesus prayed, we should be. Help us to see Jesus and him only In his mighty name we pray. And everybody said a big amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a seat. So we're talking this series through John chapter 17 about the things that Jesus thinks we should be. The things that Jesus prayed for us to be. Number one, point one, part one, sorry. Part one of this series, what it means to glow up is that in him I realize that I am transcendent. 
Ooh, that's a big fancy word. I am transcendent. Somebody say transcendent. Doesn't that feel good just to say transcendent? I like saying that word. That's one of those words that's nice to say, transcendent. But you say, what's, what's transcendent mean? It means, it means this. We've got the definition up on the screen. It means existence beyond the normal or physical level. This is what a Christian is. A Christian is not somebody that goes to church. A Christian is not somebody that just does nice things for nice people or other people. A Christian is not an American. A Christian is a transcendent being. You are above the level of normal and physical. That you've come to realize that this is not all that there is. And that's good news because this might stink for you right now. Like this might be bad. You might be in a body that is not glowing up but dimming out. <laughs> not many people laughed over here. I'm worried about you. You know, like it gets to that point where you, you only glow up so far and then suddenly you realize the light's starting to fade. You notice how, how your body works. The older you get, the, the more your body starts to just head toward the grave. <laughs> Things just head downward. It's like your body telling you, I know where I'm going. I'm getting a head start on you. <laughs> Man, you notice how your hair, you don't lose your hair. It just relocates to lower portions of the body. <laughs> You're glowing down. <laughs> This is, this is why you need to be at church, because you need to be remembered that this is not all that there is. This might be bad for you. Relationships might be bad for you, like right now. You might be in a marriage where you both hate each other. Good news. Someday you die. <laughs> and the marriage is over. And you don't have to be married in heaven. There's no marriage in heaven. Some theologians believe that's why we're able to live forever in heaven, because there's no marriage. Some, some theologians, not this one, not this one. I love my wife, okay? This is not all that there is. And you've got to wake up to this reality or else you'll get obsessed with temporal shifting sands of culture. You can't root your identity in something that changes. Because if it changes, that means you got to as well. Jesus, this is eternal life. John 17, 3. He's like, this should be a memory verse for you. This is eternal life that they may know you, that they will know the only true God. I love that little adjective there. And then he says, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Can you write this down in your notes? Eternal life is not about quantity. It's about quality. It's not about just living forever. Because if your life stinks, living forever is not going to help. If you don't like the 70 years you've been given on this earth, or 80 or 90 years you've been given on this earth, adding 80 billion years to it is not going to help. Eternal life is not about quantity. It's about quality. How are you living? And Jesus came to give you a different kind of life. Like a life that matters. A life that's above the physical and the normal level of our world. So how do we get there? Well, Jesus maps it out right there in John 17, 3. I'm going to just look at that verse today. In John 17, 3, he defines eternal transcendent life. If you're taking notes, write this down. Point number one. A transcendent life happens when I, number one, experience God. When I experience God. When I experience God. So Jesus prays, this is eternal life that they will know you. And the word know is, yeah, it's kind of a deceiving word in English. The Greek word is gnosko. The Greeks had several words for what we sum up in English as one word. Like the Greeks had five words for love. We have one word for love. The Greeks had like three words for knowledge. We have one word for knowledge. And, and the word gnosko, the Greek word here for knowledge, is not information. It's not just you know about God, you've heard of God, you believe there is a God. It's, the word is defined as knowledge through experience. Let me illustrate. 
I can describe the beach to you. I can tell you what it looks like. I can show you pictures. I can show you videos of me and my kids playing in the sand on the beach. I could go to the beach, bottle up some sand, bring it to you, stick it in your nose and say, smell, that's the beach. But you and I both know that you never really know what the beach is like until what? Until you what? Go to the beach. Once you've been there, now you know through experience, that's the beach. Here's what I'm talking about with God. Other people can tell you about God. Other people can describe God. You could have been raised in a family that believed in God or maybe denied the existence of God. I'm happy you're here, but listen to me. Nobody can truly give you the experience of God other than the Lord Jesus Christ who came from God. He said to Philip, he said, Philip, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. You want to know what God is like? God is like Jesus. He is the full revelation of the fullness of God, and you were made. You were made to experience God. Have you had an experience with God? And I'm not, I'm not, I'm not asking you, have you been to church? Have you been confirmed? Have you been baptized? I'm not asking that question. I'm asking, have you ever been there? Where you knew Jesus made God real to you and changed your life to experience God. You know, this is why, again, you don't want to listen to culture about this stuff because culture likes to deny this exists, especially in our higher education department. If you walk into a psychology 101 class, students, pay attention, teenagers, pay attention here because you're going you're to experience this. You're going to go to college and I'm going to tell you about a guy by the name of Abraham Maslow. And Abraham Maslow in 1946 developed something called the hierarchy of human needs. He's a psychologist. A lot of, lot of today, our, our, our psychological uh, field is based on this, the hierarchy of human needs. And Maslow basically proposed that humans were a bunch of needs. Lower level needs, medium level needs, upper medium level needs, highest need. And so I want to put the, the triangle that he came up with. It's called Maslow's triangle of human or hierarchy of human needs. And basically he, ba he says at the bottom level, you've got physiological needs. That's like food, water, clothing, then you need safety, like on top of those needs. After you get safety, you need love and belonging. You need somebody to love you, and you need sexual intimacy. Then he says the self-esteem. This is where we get participation trophies from, right here. Okay, you need self-esteem, confidence, achievement, respect of others. And then after you get all of those first four needs, then you can finally do what he says, self-actualize. You can become the fullness of who you are. And when you go to college, teenagers, listen, please, I'm doing you a favor. When you go to college, they're going to show you that pyramid. They're going to tell you that's, that's what he came up with. And they're not going to tell you the truth. They're not going to tell you the truth. Because Abraham Maslow developed that hierarchy of human needs in 1946. And 30 years later, he came up with a stunning conclusion. And he wrote another book called The Farthest Reaches of Human Nature. And in that book, he says, I was wrong. He says, self-actualization is not enough for humanity. Humanity needs an experience with something beyond itself. You were made for this. Do you know what word he used to describe it? Transcendence. You're made for transcendence. Did you ever notice how the less... Christian America becomes, it doesn't get less spiritual. It just gets wacky. It just gets crazy, weird. Because we're made for something more. And for a hundred years in this country, the church denied the spiritual to its own detriment. To its own detriment. Because I thought, oh, people can't believe in the supernatural anymore. So let's not talk about the supernatural. Let's just talk about the good morality that Jesus has come to. And how many know good morality is fine, but you need something more than just being a good person? You need an experience with the living, transcendent God who formed you, who loved you, and he gave his son to die for you so that you can experience him, not just do good things. <laughs> to know him. To know him. Number two, if you're taking notes, a transcendent life happens when I no longer desire to serve any other God. 
when I no longer desire to serve any other God because any other God just won't do. So I don't serve any God. Yeah, you do. A God is whatever controls you. A God is whatever you give your money, energy, health, and time to. Some of your gods are the name of a spouse. Some of your gods are the name of a designer brand. Some of your gods are the upper middle class neighborhood that you long to be a part of and you'll give your money, time, health, wealth, all of that to get there. Idols. When Israel comes out of Egypt and God miraculously saves them through the Red Sea, Abraham goes up to the mountain, he comes back down and he says, here's what God told me, you shall have no other gods before me. You're not going to serve anybody else. If you serve anybody else, they'll make you a slave. If you serve me, I'll make you a son. God came to make you and I his children. And when we deny his lordship and his kingship and his authority, we'll be slaves to everything else. Slaves to our time, our schedules, our spouse. Some of you, you never fight with your spouse. You know why? Because they're your God. You never want to disappoint them. Some of you, you never discipline your children. Do you know why? Because they're your God. You never want to let them down. You never want to get their disapproval because you can't handle the disapproval of your God. Whatever, whatever frightens you, whatever frightens you that you could lose it and it could be gone and taken from you, I have just identified that is your God. And no other God will do. This is why Jesus prays, not just this is your eternal life, that they know you, but he gives a little qualifier, the only true God. There's only one God. There's only one true God. Every other God is a liar. Every other God is a failure. Every other God will let you down eventually. It just takes a matter of time before you realize serving that God ended you up in slavery. That's why Jesus said, I have manifested in verse six. I've manifested your name. I've shown you what you're, I've shown them, Father. I've shown them your name. The word name means character here. I've shown them what you're like. You want to know what God is like? Look at Jesus. He's the fullness of the deity in bodily form. He says, what do we do in this culture? As we are tremendously audacious. So I think that God is like, fill in the blank. Some of you, that's your thing. Well, I think that God is like, I like the God, love and peace and harmony, but I'm not so down with the judgment and the fire and the brimstone. <laughs> I'm not a big fan of brimstone. Anything. Like, this is the hypocrisy of humanity. You don't do that with any other person on the planet. And you certainly wouldn't let anybody do that to you, would you? You wouldn't live with it if somebody said, well, I think that you are like this. You'd be like, that's not who I am. You don't know me. You do not have the right to define what I am like because you don't know me. Why is it okay then for you to do that about God? You, me, specs. on the back of specks, <laughs> on this circulating speck called Earth. It's a speck in the sight of the solar system, which is a speck inside of the galaxy, which is a speck inside of the universe. And we're going to say, here's what God is like. Really? You can't do that. You don't have the right to do that. There's one God. There's one true God. There's one man who came and showed up. His name was Jesus, and he said these words. He said, look, everybody that came before me was a thief and a liar. And they're going to be coming after me, and they're going to say, I am the Christ, and I am he, and here I am. And he said, don't listen to them. There's only one true God. There's only one man who shed his blood for you and for me. And his name is Jesus Christ, the only son of the living God. He's the only one. He's awesome. Say, listen, you say, oh, Pastor, what about all those other religions? What about all those other religions? They're wrong. Amen. But what about the 1.8 billion Muslims on the planet? They're wrong. You see, 
You see, I'm a, I'm a pastor. I'm not a politician. I can tell you the truth. They're, they're wrong. They're wrong. But I know good Hindus. They're wrong. But my boss is a Buddhist. He's wrong. Nobody else will tell you this. If I hated you, I would tell you something different. If I was running for office, I'd tell you something different. I don't need your approval. I don't need you to like me. I'm here to tell you the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And Jesus is the truth. Now you said, listen, but there's so many people that don't believe. How can so many people be so wrong? Okay, listen, I didn't say that. Jesus said that. See, there's a lot of people that don't believe the truth then. And Jesus says, I know. And it breaks his heart. He says in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 7, he says, enter by the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the way is, say that word, easy. easy. That leads to destruction. And those who enter it are many. Oh, why did he have to say Many. I wish he said, those who entered are like one or two in each generation, like Hitler, Mao, Stalin. They missed it, but the rest of us are good. <laughs> Doesn't say that. Many. And then he says, for the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are what? Few. Few. You don't have to be a mathematician to put this together. And Jesus says there's... Many more people who will miss it than who find it. And even in the Christian church. So I've met Christians, Pastor. They're terrible. I don't like Christians. I don't have any Christian friends because they're terrible. Have you met a real Christian? Because anybody can say they're Christian. And just a few verses later in that passage, Jesus actually says this. There are many Christians who aren't really Christians. He says it just a little bit later, verse 22. He says, on that day, many. Oh, now why many? Why many? I don't want many to be there, but it's there. Many will say to me, Lord, Lord. They got the Christian, they got the Christian lingo down. Lord, Lord. Did we not prophesy in your name, cast out demons in your name, do mighty miracles in your name, go to Waters Church every Christmas and Easter in your name? <laughs> and then I would declare to them, to who? To the many. I don't know you. You went through the form of religion and you never found me. Many will say, I don't like that many. But Jesus said it, and I have to communicate it. Have you found the only true God? So once you find the only true God, no other God will do. No other God will do. Did I tell you that I went to Mexico? And in Mexico, I tried tequila. Because what else are you supposed to do in Mexico? <laughs> I went to, on this tour with my wife, and we went to this little tour of a, a tequila plant farm factory. I don't know what it was. And they brought us through a little process of making tequila. And then at the end of the tour, they brought us a little table, a little Mexican guide there. It's just showing, here's the tequila, try the tequila. There's like several tequilas. Like here's the one-year-old tequila. I'd never liked tequila. I always thought that tequila tasted like nail polish remover. Anybody with me on that? <laughs> it makes you feel funny. Like, right, he stings. It's like, why am I drinking acid and thinking this is a good time? <laughs> so he says, look, here's tequila. You've never had real tequila. He says, here, here's the one-year tequila. I tried the one-year tequila nail polish remover. So here's a three-year tequila. Three-year tequila. Still nail polish remover. And then there's a little golden, little golden bottle of tequila. I said, what's that? He said, that's the 12-year-old stuff. So let me try that. Can I tell you that I tried the 12-year-old tequila, and when I tasted it, I went, hallelujah. <laughs> this is what tequila should be. All tequila should be like this tequila. 
Some of you are like incredibly uncomfortable that the pastor's talking this much about tequila. I understand that. I didn't buy any tequila for myself. I bought some for our executive pastor, Shane Parsons. He likes tequila. I can't go back to regular tequila, friends. And I don't drink. But I had the real thing. Can I tell you this? When you meet Jesus, no other God will do. And you can't go back. You can't go back. I've decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. Just won't do. Have you known and experienced the one true God? Thirdly, a transcendent life happens when I experience the power of Jesus Christ. Not the information, not the doctrine. It's as important as doctrine is, and I'm all about doctrine, and you should know that if you come here any amount of time. I'm all about right doctrine. But the power of Jesus, the power to change you and make you new. He's the only one that's got the power. He prays this lastly in verse 3. Um, I'm sorry, in verse, in verse 2. See, because he says in Jesus Christ whom you have sent in verse 3. But back up to verse 2, and here's what he says. Since you, Father, he's talking to the Father. This is Jesus' prayer. Since you, Father have given him, who to him? The Son, Jesus. You, God of creation, have given the Son authority. Another word for authority is power. Power over all, say that next word, flesh. The only one who has authority or power over all flesh is the one that God had given to him by the creator of all flesh, Jesus Christ. This is important because this verse, when I was studying this week, this verse brought such comfort to my heart and I wanted to leave comfort in yours today. Because I, I don't know about you, but my flesh is not good. You know what? The Bible talks about your flesh all the time. And the flesh... In the Bible is that part of you that's rotten. The part of you that you keep hidden, stowed away in the corners of your life. The part of you that only your spouse sees. And they don't even get the full brunt force. Well, sometimes they do, but they don't usually. Or your kids see it, or your mom or your dad see it. I'm talking about that part of you that if you were really, really, really honest, you would say like I have to say to you, I can't control it, and I hate it, and I want to change, and I can't. It's the flesh. So the Bible says it like this all the time. It's talked about it all the time. Psalm 51, verse 5, surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. David prays that prayer after he commits adultery with Bathsheba and kills her husband. He says, I'm rotten. In another passage, Jeremiah 17, 9. Preach your favorite here. Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart of man is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? Desperately sick. Who can understand it? Mark 7, 21, Jesus' own words says, From within, from within, out of the heart of man comes... Evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these things Jesus has come from within. Not the television set, from within. And they defile us. In Romans chapter 7, verse 18, Paul says, For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh, for I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. There's a rotten part of me. It's called my flesh. There's a rotten part of you. It's called your flesh. 
and you can't stop it and you can't control it. The good news is 2,000 years ago, Jesus obeyed the Father perfectly. And because he obeyed the Father perfectly, the Father gave him authority, power, dominion over even the rotten part of you. And he has the power to change who you are and knock out what you don't like and change you into the image of himself so that you become blown up to the glory of God. It's the last thing I want you to write in your notes. Only Jesus has the authority to transform your life. This is eternal life that you experience the only true God and the power of Jesus Christ.